The Sharp family lived in Victoria, Australia, a place with peaceful beaches and quiet suburban life. John Sharp, his pregnant wife Anna, and their adorable daughter Gracie seemed a happy family. But this image was soon shattered, leading to one of the most heart-wrenching cases in Australian history. In March 2004, the Sharp family home became a crime scene. Anna Kemp and her daughter Gracie vanished without a trace. Born on February 28, 1967, John Sharp grew up in a world familiar to many of us. A childhood marked by the usual ups and downs, aspirations shaped by the world around him, and the pursuit of happiness supported by his family. Raised in a community where neighbors knew each other by name and children played freely under the sun, John's formative years seemed filled with simple joys. As John transitioned into adolescence, those who knew him observed his evolution from a bright-eyed child into a quiet, somewhat introverted young man. Intelligent and courteous, yet always on the periphery as if watching the world from a distance, John was always there, but somehow apart. Like he was searching for something he couldn't quite find among the people around him. It was during these formative years that John's path began to subtly diverge, laying the groundwork for the man he would become. His silent observations, the unvoiced thoughts simmering beneath a calm exterior, might have been the early signs of an upcoming storm. Anna Kemp, coming from New Zealand, brought with her the promise of new beginnings when she arrived in Australia. Her infectious smile and love of life touched the hearts of those around her, including John Sharps. They met at the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, where they both worked. Anna was four years John Sr. Laughter shared over coffee and long walks along the beach culminated in their wedding day. Anna's spirit was a stark contrast to John's quiet introspection. Yet their paths were destined to intertwine, igniting a tragic sequence of events. Maybe it was the allure of opposites attracting that drew them together, or perhaps something deeper, a shared longing for connection, for being understood. They married in October 1994 and lived in various places around the Mornington Peninsula area of South Melbourne. The future seemed bright, filled with endless possibilities. But behind the joys of marriage, the initial signs of strain began to emerge. The arrival of a child brings a new dawn for a family. Gracie, born in August 2002, with her innocent eyes and radiant smile, became the center of John and Anna's world. Yet the joy of parenthood also brought new challenges, casting long shadows on their peaceful family life. Every home holds its secrets, its private sorrows and silent battles. For John and Anna, the dream of a happy family life in the suburbs of the Mornington Peninsula soon faced trials that tested their bond. Gracie was diagnosed with hip dysplasia, requiring a corrective orthopedic harness and causing her endless discomfort. Her early months were marked by relentless crying and sleepless nights, a situation that tested her parents to their limits. Once the harness was removed, problems with eating began and her sleep issues persisted. Anna sought professional help for these challenges. The family relocated one last time to a residence on Prince Street in Mornington, a quiet coastal town about 35 miles south of Melbourne. This place would tragically become the final setting for Anna and Gracie. In November 2003, Anna became pregnant with their second child. Gracie was just 15 months old. Anna was very excited. She was a loving mother, and Gracie was what she was living for. She'd always wanted more than one child because she never wanted her daughter to be on her own so that when she and her husband were no longer there, Gracie would have somebody. The facade of family harmony lasted until March 21, 2004, at a nephew's birthday celebration, the last time when Anna was seen alive. Guests saw no signs of discord between Anna and her caring husband John. The next day, Anna dropped Gracie off at daycare and arranged to catch up with a friend. Her final contact with someone outside her marriage occurred the day after, during a call to her private health insurance company, where she discussed extending their health cover to include their expected child. Then John called Anna's friends to tell them she had left with another man and had left Gracie with him. He reached out to Anna's mother, claiming she had abandoned him for another man, and he was unaware of her whereabouts, though he anticipated she would return for their daughter within the week. He kept bringing Gracie to her daycare, telling the staff that he and his wife had parted ways, which meant Gracie wouldn't be coming back to the daycare. Anna's family received emails from Anna, and her mother received a bouquet of flowers from her daughter, but no phone call. 
The initial shock and confusion of Anna's friends and family quickly turned to worry. How could a devoted mother and her child simply disappear without a word? By May 2004, Sharp, engaging with the media, painted a picture of a man tormented by his family's disappearance. He said to the local paper, Anyone that knows me knows I gave 100% for my daughter and my marriage. In a public plea, Sharp, holding a photo of Gracie, professed enduring love for Anna, saying, Anna, our marriage may be over, but I still love you, and you are the mother of our beautiful daughter Gracie, whom we both adore more than anyone else. He claimed he had spoken to Anna a week earlier and that she had left him for another man. He asked anyone with information to come forward. He said, My biggest fear is being denied a part of Gracie's future. His demeanor and statements, however, seemed odd and struck a discordant note, inviting scrutiny over his narrative's authenticity. Despite proclaiming their marital dissolution, an inconsistency highlighted by his premature use of the past tense when speaking about his family, a detail that did not escape police notice. Behind the scenes, law enforcement began to peel back the layers of John Sharp's carefully constructed narrative. Each unanswered question pointed to a darker reality. What secrets lay buried within the Sharp family? Anna and her mother used to call each other every couple of days. When Anna missed several of her calls, she grew concerned. She called Sharp, who justified Anna's absence with weak explanations like being busy taking Gracie to daycare. This made her even more worried. Anna's devout Catholic beliefs and her unlikely affair and abandonment, initially without Gracie and at 20 weeks pregnant, fueled her family's distrust toward Sharp's account, further aggravated by the impersonal email and gift without any phone contact. Upon Anna's continued absence, her mother alerted the police in New Zealand and reported her daughter missing, prompting communication with the Mornington authorities. Confronted by the police, Sharp told them Anna got into a blue car and relocated to Chelsea with their daughter, denying any knowledge or involvement into their disappearance. The search for Anna and Gracie commenced with urgency. Missing persons officer Norell Fraser said detectives had to keep an open mind and not assume the mother and daughter were dead as they had only been reported missing. She said Anna's bank account had been used intermittently and her phone was used once or twice. We kept thinking, is she alive? But as days passed, hope began to fade, replaced by a gnawing realization that the answers they sought might reveal a truth too painful to bear. Sharp quickly became the main suspect suspect since there was no evidence to support his statement. The investigation's pace quickened as new information surfaced. Friends and acquaintances came forward, their testimonies shedding light on the growing tensions behind the closed doors of the Sharps' home. One of the friends confessed, she mentioned they were going through a tough time. I never imagined it could lead to this. The investigators increased pressure on Sharp, trying to make him nervous so that he would make a mistake. He lived like a recluse and never had guests. Their family home was ominously quiet. John was followed by undercover officers to monitor his movements. Soon there was a breakthrough in the case. To mislead investigators, Sharp periodically utilized Anna's phone and bank card, crafting an illusion of her active presence across the southeast suburbs of Victoria. However, this charade crumbled under police surveillance, capturing Sharp's attempts to conceal evidence. The surveillance caught him on camera driving to Chelsea Beach and pulling a white plastic bag from a bush next to the public toilet. He took out Anna's phone from the bag and made a call. Then, he withdrew some cash from the nearest ATM. After that, he disposed of the bag with the phone and card by putting them into a trash can in Mount Martha. He then drove home and called the missing persons unit, telling them that his wife had just called him and withdrawn cash from their joint account. But the team already knew exactly what had happened. The evidence was irrefutable, pointing to a conclusion that was unthinkable. Not having enough evidence to charge Sharp with murders and being unable to determine his motive, the investigators hoped that he could lead them to the bodies. But as days passed with no action from Sharp, the decision to arrest him was made. On June 10th, Sharp faced another round of questioning by the authorities. He persisted that Anna had willingly departed on March 23rd. However, the investigators remained skeptical, noting his emotional detachment regarding his wife's supposed affair and subsequent departure with their daughter. Discrepancies in Sharp's timeline emerge. The man who claimed ignorance now appears as a master of evasion. Norell Fraser said about Sharp, I don't think anybody would know how John felt about anything. He was a closed book. He was very insular. He was a loner. He didn't show any emotion. He showed no personality. 
The investigators thought of another way to get his confession. They invited his parents and showed them the footage of John on Chelsea Beach and then asked them to talk to their son. It is the presentation of an undeniable piece of evidence that marks the turning point in the investigation. An hour after his parents left, John began to talk as he realized the inevitability of his situation. His final barriers of denial and self-preservation eroded, revealing the truth of his psyche, a man ensnared by his own darkest impulses. What turned his heart so cold that he became a stranger even to those who thought they knew him best? Sometimes the greatest dangers lurk in the places we expect the least. Sharp's confession laid bare the reality of what transpired within the walls of the Sharp home. He told police he had fantasies of murdering his wife for several months before ultimately killing her. Adjusting to life with a baby, sleepless nights, financial pressures, and the routine of daily life added layers of complexity, pushing the family to a breaking point. Sharp explained that he killed Anna because she was controlling and moody and was getting on his nerves. Their marriage was unhappy. Sharp perceived his wife's assertive personality as undermining his masculinity. He stated Anna used to wear the pants in the family. Sharp told the investigators that Anna's pregnancy was a surprise to him. He didn't want another child and viewed the new pregnancy as an additional burden, harboring resentment towards Anna and their unborn child in silence instead of voicing his concerns. He even questioned if it was his child at all. John was self-employed as a conveyancer. The financial responsibility of a growing family overwhelmed him. He seemed withdrawn. Anna was trying to bridge the growing distance between them. But as she reached out, John's retreat into himself became more pronounced. With each passing day, John became more distant, a prisoner of his own mind, ensnared by thoughts he could not share and feelings he could not express. Anna fought to keep her family together, unaware of the darkness taking hold of her husband's heart. The chasm between John, isolated in his thoughts, and Anna, attending to the needs of their home and children, widened, filled with unsaid words and unacknowledged fears. Anna found herself facing a wall of silence, her efforts met with indifference, or worse, hostility. Sharp made an unexpected and ominous purchase in early 2003, a high-powered spear gun from a sport Philip Marine in Mornington, an interest he had never before expressed. This marked the beginning of a dark and tragic chapter. Sharp dedicated countless hours to mastering the spear gun in their backyard, familiarizing himself with its mechanics. In the days that followed, a domestic dispute escalated into an unimaginable horror. Gerald Kemp, Anna's brother, told reporters that in February 2004, Anna had an ultrasound to determine their baby's gender, but Sharp did not even bother going to the doctor's appointment with her. Upon her return, she anticipated her husband's eagerness to learn about the baby's gender, only to find he showed no interest and didn't even ask her. Distressed by his apathy, Anna confronted Sharp, warning him that if he continued to be indifferent to their daughter and unborn child, she was going to leave him. They went to bed at around 9 or 10 p.m. Anna quickly fell asleep, while John stayed awake, consumed by their argument and the overall dissatisfaction with their marriage. Eventually, he stepped out to the backyard garage, retrieving the spear gun that he didn't use outside of his target practice sessions. In a chilling sequence of events, Sharp crept back into the room where Anna was sleeping peacefully, coldly aiming a charged spear gun at her while their 20-month-old daughter lay asleep in her bed. The first shot did not end her life as she was still breathing, and with a grim resolve, he reloaded and fired again, this time fatally wounding Anna and the unborn child she carried. Afterward, he covered her with towels and retreated to sleep the rest of the night on the sofa downstairs. The next morning, Sharp tried to remove the spears, but managed to remove only the shafts. Completing this grim task, he then dropped off Gracie at her daycare, later turning away a TV antenna technician booked by Anna with the excuse of Anna's absence, her body still in the bedroom. Under the cover of night, he buried Anna in a hastily dug shallow grave in the garden. Officer Fraser said, it's almost difficult to describe, but to hear a man talk about murdering his wife who was three months pregnant, that was hard enough, but he said it with no emotion whatsoever. She compared his confession to saying what he'd had for breakfast that morning. In the days that followed, Sharp took Gracie and revisited the marine supply store for another spear. He said, I was thinking of taking care of Gracie by myself, and just amongst all this madness, that's when I lost the plot. When asked why he killed Gracie, he said, I don't really know, and called it irrational madness. 
Sharp told the police, you know what you're doing is sort of insane, but there's just this weird part of you that's almost unstoppable or something. You're almost like on automatic pilot sort of thing. I can't really remember much of what I thought of anything, just apart from the sort of crazy sensation. It was totally emotional. He said that for the next four days, voices in his head debated Gracie's fate. A few days after the murder, he started thinking Gracie needed to be with her mum. It was sort of in and out of my head all week. I could hear things going through my head. The voices saying, you can't do it. You can do it. You've got to do it. Every option was coming up. On March 27th, after putting Gracie into her cot, Sharp drank a few glasses of whiskey and cola, confessing that he did this to numb his senses for what he was about to do. Then he went to the garage. Armed once again with the spear gun, he inflicted unimaginable terror on Gracie, who endured multiple shots before her tragic death at her father's hands. Same as Anna, Gracie didn't die at once. After the fourth shot, she was dead. The next morning, Sharp returned to Gracie's bedroom. He could not bear looking at her, so he had to hold a towel in front of his face. Then he removed the bolts. Concluding his macabre errands, Sharp acquired a chainsaw at a local Bunnings Warehouse hardware store in Frankston. He unearthed Anna's remains from their garden. He then disposed of Anna's and Gracie's bodies in garbage bags at the Mornington Refuse Transfer Station. He also discarded the spear gun, the chainsaw, and Gracie's clothes and toys. I have a bootload of hard waste, he told the attendant. Officer Fraser said, this is his wife that's pregnant. I kept thinking what was coming next. And then he told us about little Gracie. It's the most difficult interview I have ever listened to. I remember at one stage, there was a break in the interview. I went to the ladies' toilets and I just put my head in my hands. I couldn't listen. Sharp then called Anna's friends and family with a fabricated story of her affair. Her friends said that immediately, alarm bells rang and her hairs on the back of her neck stood up because there was no way Anna would leave Gracie behind. Following the murder of his daughter, he made a second call to his mother-in-law, telling her that Gracie was now with Anna in a bigger and better place. At his residence, Sharp crafted an email from Anna to her family in New Zealand to convince them she was fine. The messages didn't sound like her daughter had written them. Sharp used Anna's email account to contact her brother as well. In the email, he claimed she had departed with another man with whom she was expecting a child. One of the emails read, Please respect and understand my wish for privacy and take comfort in the fact that I'm about to enjoy life like I have never before. This act only intensified the mystery surrounding Anna's prolonged silence. The family filed a missing person report on Anna. The interview uncovered that he had jotted down notes for his cover story. While analyzing Sharp's TV appearances, body language expert Dr. Cliff Lansley said that this was a poor attempt at portraying concern and sadness. He was juggling his eyebrows, contorting his face, and using a tissue as a prop, though there was no moisture on his nose, no tears on his face. It's a convincing tactic that we rarely see with truth-tellers. The family told the police some disturbing facts. They believed Sharp's motive for murdering Anna was her discovery of Gracie's abuse by her husband. Although there was no evidence to support this theory, Sharp had a history of abusing the children of family and friends. Anna didn't know this before marrying him. One relative said, we reckon she caught him, we think that's why he killed her. When one of Sharp's former victims became an adult, she confronted him about the abuse. In response, Sharp called her a derogatory name and told her she deserved it. The victim was tormented by the thought that reporting it earlier could have prevented the murders. Anna's brother later said that after the couple's honeymoon, she told her mother about their marriage, I think I've made a mistake. Her brother remarked, she just carried on with the mistake. She said there was no passion or love. Nevertheless, the couple continued their life together. An exhaustive three-week search at a landfill in Mornington eventually led to the discovery of both Anna and Gracie's remains. Norell Fraser was a member of Victoria Police for almost 30 years. One case she will never forget is the Mornington Monster. During the search, she spotted a blue bag. She opened it, but saw a kitchen glove. So, the search continued. However, she had a gut feeling that something was wrong. So she returned to the bag. She then realized that the glove was not what it seemed. She said, it's funny, but I knew I'd find Anna. Just an innate feeling I can't describe any better than that. And when I did find her, I couldn't leave her. I sat with the bag, waiting for crime scene to arrive. I couldn't bear the thought of her being alone in the tip without anyone with her. I've thought about it since, and I know it sounds bizarre, but I almost feel like Anna was reaching out to me. I was determined to make sure that Anna wouldn't end her life in this tip. I just knew I would find her and I did. Soon she realized that Gracie must be close by. 
I put my head in my hands, and I just cried. I cried for what Anna had endured, for Anna's family, for humanity as a whole, I suppose. They were laid to rest at Green Park Cemetery in New Zealand, with Anna's maiden name, Kemp, marking their final resting place. The memorial also bears the name of Anna's unborn son, Francis. During the trial, the attorney aimed to shed light on John Sharp's psyche, his mental anguish that preceded the tragic events. Through the defense's lens, Sharp's life was depicted as being full of mounting pressures, financial strain, marital discord, and a crippling sense of entrapment. The sentencing judge said the events of the crime were too awful to contemplate and singular in its barbarity. He stated that Sharp had murdered his daughter simply so that his first crime would not be discovered which was unspeakably callous. Forensic psychologist Kerry Dane said, John Sharp was a quiet man, a shy man. Another way of looking at this was that he was actually quite socially inept. He didn't have much in the way of communication skills. He didn't have a lot of emotional intelligence. Psychiatrist Dr. Lester Walton had described Sharp as dependent, passive, and a retiring individual who was unable or reluctant to confront problems. Sharp believed the only way of solving his marriage difficulties was to kill his wife. The Mornington monster pleaded guilty to the murders committed against both Anna and Gracie, receiving two consecutive terms of life imprisonment for each, without eligibility for parole before 33 years. He will be eligible for parole in 2037. Sharp wept like a baby on hearing the verdict. He is kept under protective custody while serving his sentence, as he faces life threats from other inmates. Sharp's elderly parents said, John's crimes were horrific. He has given himself a life sentence for what he has done, and he will live with this for the rest of his life. One of Sharp's nieces said that his crimes have stolen three beautiful and precious lives. Sharp's crime is considered Victoria's worst case of familicide. Investigator Shane Brendel said, It's a healing process for us as much as anyone else, and with the passage of time that gets a little easier but it certainly makes you appreciate your own circumstances, your own family, and cherish every moment that you have with them, knowing that there's people out there that resort to these sorts of means to eradicate their own families. Just makes you know how special and important your own families are. I'd love to read your comments on the case. Please subscribe if you haven't yet, and stay in touch.